Now, the voices calling for a ceasefire and for mediation and peace in the war between Israel and Hamas are getting louder and more numerous, insisting that immediate action is needed to save lives and prevent more human suffering, even as the civilian death toll continues to rise rapidly. Among them is Bishop Matthew Kuka, Catholic Bishop of Sokoto at the extreme end of northwest Nigeria and one of this country's leading social and civil rights activists. He's been appalled by what is happening in the Middle East, a region he's visited, taking in Gaza, the West Bank, Israel and Jordan. And he's convinced that peace is possible, but with the right mediators operating under the auspices of the UN Security Council. So he's nominating the former U.S. President Barack Obama, King Abdullah of Jordan, former U.K. Prime Minister Gordon Brown, former President of Ireland Mary Robinson, and former Nigerian President Olusegun Obasanjo. So what role can they play in the resolution of this crisis in the Middle East, and how would they go about it? Well, for more on this, I'm joined now in the studio by the Catholic Bishop of Sokoto Diocese, Bishop Matthew Kuka. Bishop Kuka, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you, Charles, for inviting me. I mean, you could say, couldn't you, that you are quite a remarkable Nigerian in many ways. I mean, you're a Catholic bishop whose seat is in the very heart of the Islamic Caliphate in Sokoto, northwest Nigeria, yet you feel perfectly at home there and have nurtured a thriving minority Christian community in that region. Do you think that makes it easier for you to imagine a world in which the Israelis and the Palestinians can live side by side? Um, first of all, thank you for inviting me and uh, let me <coughs> please indulge me. I'd like to <coughs> congratulate Nigeria for the victory in London on this P and yeah, ID case. And I think we should also thank President Buhari in a very special way. Yesterday I spent quite a bit of time trying to call the former um, Attorney General uh, Malami. They deserve appreciation. Because as you know, Jonathan, President Jonathan handed over this problem mm. with an $850 million bill to be settled. And President Buhari said no. And I think their resilience has brought us to where we are. So I think I'd like to right. say we owe them that okay. gratitude. But let's come Even back to Even if we the, went off piece a little bit, but yeah, that's fine. But now, you know, I, because of my experience in this country, there are certain categories of expressions that I really don't like to use. I don't see myself as a minority. Um, and I don't want to focus on my being a Christian. First of all, essentially, um, if I had been born in Sokoto, my name probably would have been Abdallah. And if the Sultan of Sokoto had been born in my small village, maybe his name would have been Thomas. So identities are manufactured. And uh, although they are tools for negotiation, but it depends on how you want to use them as instruments. Uh, but, and I think that for a complex country like Nigeria, the focus should be, and it has not been, but it should be, one, on capacity. Two, on the fact that we are in a tent that was provided for us by God. And we spent a very long time uh, in a pit that we deliberately dug. And because we're making no progress, these identities have suddenly become instruments. I'm extremely lucky. I mean, when I was posted to Sokoto, luckily in this hotel where you are, this was the first place I met, you know, His Eminence the Sultan. And he was a, a, a young military officer, uh, the NDA, I'm mm -hmm. sorry, in, uh, in NIPS. And I remember, I don't remember his name now, but one of my friends, a northerner, called me and said, look, there's this young army officer who would like to see you. He's doing a project on religious extremism, and he's been told he has to talk to you. And I said, okay, we were doing a putter panel then. So I came here, and I met the sultan. But truth, truth be told, we had to exchange pleasantries, and that was it. One day, I'm in Port Harcourt, and I get a call. I was going in for a meeting with Dr. Odili in my negotiation with the Ogoni people, and I get a call from my phone, and gentleman says, you know, now I can remember. He said, my name is I'm Saad Abubakar or something like that. He says, uh, the Sultan of Sokoto. Uh, and I said, well, Mr. Sultan, how are you? And he says, you know, I'm fine. I said, so please, can you speak up? Because I want to, I'm going in for a meeting. He said, no, I am the one. He said, I said, why will the Sultan be calling me? I don't know him. 
And he was barely a few months as the Sultan. So I said, and he says, no, I'm the one. I said, no, you are not the one because the Sultan doesn't have my number. And he said, no, I have your number. You give, he was very patient he, because I was getting agitated. Mm. And I said to him, I said, look, you can waste your credit if you like, but <laughs> I have no business. Sultan can't be the one calling me. So he said, okay, go and finish your meeting. I said, but who gave you my number? He said, you gave me my, your number. I'm like, okay, where did I meet you? So he told me the story. But um, that's how, so I arrived Sokoto and uh, I remember my friend Adamu Adamu who was minister for education saying congratulations sultan of christians so i arrived so good and my concern is not with the christian community i'm there as a catholic bishop but luckily for me i'm not innocent because i've already achieved some kind of visibility so and i found so good people i mean even at my at my installation mm. the governor you know made contri financial contribution and so on and so forth so i have liked to us to focus on our common citizenship but now you ask the question when you see what religion and what identity has done to Nigeria, how much it has destroyed the foundation of our common existence, how the religion itself, whether Christianity or Islam, I mean, how would you explain the fact that the things that are happening in northern Nigeria have been happening? They're not done by Christians, let me put it that way. Uh, the things that are happening in the southeast, it's not as if a bunch of Muslims are the ones who are going around. So we have a country to fix, and I can see that the consequences of delaying managing this crisis is really what has led us to where we are now. Mm. So it, it explains my sentiments about what is happening in the Middle East. Well, I will come back to Nigeria in, in a moment, but returning to the Middle East, which is the focus of our chat, um, most of it, to be clear, you're not just talking from the point of view of an armchair analyst. I mean, you've been to Gaza and you've visited the Palestinian Authority's headquarters. I believe it's in the West Bank. You've also been to the Israeli Knesset or Parliament and you've toured the different quarters of Jerusalem. You've been in Jordan. So you've seen the conditions in that region and you are talking from the position of first-hand knowledge. I have, you know, I have been to some troubled areas. Mm. I've been to Northern Ireland. And when I went to Northern Ireland, I went to the most troubled part of Northern Ireland. Um, and the day before I went to Northern Ireland, I was, I, was, I was in Dublin. And one of the nuns had said to me, our Irish nun, she said, I, you know, I will accompany you to, you know, to, 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 to Northern Ireland. Unfortunately for me, I was, I was in England as a student. But a week before my arrival, I already laid a bomb mm. on, the, on, the, on the rail. Just as, a, as a, an aside, I lived and worked in Northern Very Ireland. Very good. So <laughs> I, I worked so, for the BBC so there. I already blew up right. one train. Right. And uh, so when I arrived, sister called me, said, are you still coming? I said, yes, I'm still coming. And um, so I arrived. And she said, you know what, I'm not going. And I said to her, Jokil, I said, look, this is the safest time to travel because they're not going to lay another bomb again. So anyway, I went, I went round the whole mm. place. I came back and then uh, I, I, I also, I've been to South Africa. I went around to Soweto just to see some of these places. The crisis in Rwanda, I decided deliberately, you know, I was at the Kennedy School then to take time out just to go and see what happened in Rwanda. I travel around. And, so I am not just a spectator mm. of, of crisis, but I also believe that as a priest, you know, we are agents of reconciliation. And I come to the table with all sense of humility. I mean, this accident, this conversation started purely by accident, if we may, uh, excuse me. Just mm. on, uh, was it last week? You know, I was listening to BBC. And so I heard that President Joe Biden was going to. And I said to myself, okay, let me just send a text to BBC Newsday, to the desk, to say, mm. look, I'm expressing my sentiments. Look, Joe Biden, please, please do everything that is possible to tell Netanyahu to calm down. Let us save lives. Look, this is not about Hamas. It's not about the palace. It's, not, it's about our common humanity. So, so next thing, BBC doesn't read my text. BBC calls me and says, listen, listen, this is a big one. Can you please add your voice? And I said, I'm more than happy to add my voice. I did. And then uh, the, 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 the editor of, of, of Premium Times mm -hmm. said he read, he was happy, he listened to it. And then he then I granted him the interview. So, for me, I mean, this conversation is escalating, but I'm also saying that the situation is not irredeemable. Maybe short, medium, and long term. So the things I'm talking about, I'm not expecting that this body will jump into. No, it is that there are so many battles that are being fought simultaneously. 
And there's a lot of heavy lifting to be done. But primarily, my concern is we need to deploy a certain level of moral, moral courage and moral authority to say, listen, people, it can't go on like this. A lot of mistakes have been made. And as I mentioned in my, in my, in my, in my, in my interview, uh, the Palestinians themselves have made some terrible mistakes. Um, the Israelis have made some mistakes. Because if we go back to 1947, with the creation of Israel and the opportunities that were offered, remember the, the Second World War ended in 1945. Mm. There is a lot of anxiety around the world and sympathy for the Jewish people who are stranded in the middle of nowhere and they've got no home. And like the saying say, it goes, it says, when the Jewish people began to settle, the question is whose land it is? And they say, no, this is a land without a people, waiting for a people without a land. Um, there are documents, there is evidence of Palestinians selling lands. But none of these things can count against them because nobody knew how this picture was going to unfold. Because as you go on from the 20s, the 30s, then the First World War, then the Second World War, the map begins to change. Now we have ended up where we've ended up. But there have been, and I mentioned, a lot of opportunities. And that's when I mentioned all the people I mentioned in my, in my they are the result of some pretty serious reflection. Mm. America has to be in the room because they are, for now, pound for pound, the most powerful nation in the world. And they were under President Roosevelt in 1945, very much at the table. The British have to be there. But, mm -hmm. And I also discounted certain people for obvious reasons. Um, well, I, I was actually going to come to that because right. you, you, you made some very interesting points. One of them is that there needs to be this moral heavy lifting now, right. this moral courage. And I can tell you that tonight, the... the um, the UN Secretary General has absolutely astonished the world by coming out to say quite openly at a session of the UN with the uh, Israeli ambassador there, the Palestinian representative and all of that, that, that the Palestinians are not really to blame for what is happening there now. I mean, Hamas, yes, but not the Palestinian people, and that this must stop. And he so outraged the Israeli ambassador, who then called for him to resign. But th the reason I'm bringing that up is that voices like yours are, are seeming to gain more courage in trying to say that things must calm down. Now, you've nominated um, former U.S. President Barack Obama. You were talking about the Americans having to be in the room. You nominated King Abdullah of Jordan, former U.K. Prime Minister Gordon Brown, former President of Ireland Mary Robinson, and some might say, surprise, surprise, former Nigerian President Olusegun Obasanjo to be part of this mediating team that you recommended under the auspices of the UN Security Council. Why them? Good. The first thing is, you know, as I said, President Roosevelt, um, in 1945, uh, they more or less were at the scene of the crime. The United Kingdom had been there way back 1917, Balfour mm. Declaration, all that stuff. Now, so you cannot move forward with this conversation without the United States of America. Remember, I didn't say this person is chairman or mm. that person is chairman. Then I came to the UK and I said, well, the United Kingdom has to be there for very practical, strategic reasons. They were the ones who demanded um, how they, what happened, where they dropped the ball. Because by 1947, all kinds of things began to happen. In 1946, you have the bombing of the, of the King David Hotel, mm. which was the headquarters of the, of the, of the, of the, of the British uh, government. And that threw the British off balance. So, but I looked at the, British, uh, at the UK and I said, okay, Tony Blair is a little bit tainted because of his role in uh, so, Iraq. And I found that Gordon Brown is, not only does he have the intellectual capacity, but he's also somebody who is visibly invisible. Um, so I thought he would be like a good representation. I wanted to, th I thought of the two women, Margaret May and Miss Truss, but I didn't think that any of them had that kind of gravitas. For Mary Robinson, whom I know as a person, um, I felt coming from Ireland, first female president of Ireland. Uh, she also is a founding member of the elders, mm. set up by Nelson Mandela and Archbishop Tutu and quite a good number of them. And I thought that she could bring that experience and have a bit of empathy, you know, in, in dealing with this situation. Then I thought, initially I thought of uh, Tabombeki, 
But I also felt that Thabo Mbeki did not have the kind of reach that Obasanjo had because Obasanjo can call anybody anywhere in the world at any time and any hour. And he already has that visibility and so on. And that he also has the capacity and the reflexes mm. to represent the sentiments of the, of, 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 of the people of Africa, so to say. Um, I thought, I'm sure going forward, China has to be in the room. The Russians have to be in the room. Andrew Gramico, in 1947, stood up by the United Nations and made this incredible address in support of the Palestinians. So the point is that a lot of mistakes have been made. Mm. Um, when the Palestinians were given a homeland, you know, in 1947 or 48, they didn't take it. And they said, no, we don't want, this is our land. We, we're going to keep our land. And then the Israelis took what was theirs and moved on from there. And then they began to solve the problem by, first of all, they put down this law of return. And the law of return in Israel says that it doesn't matter where you are in the world. If you have a drop of Israeli blood in you, I'm sure a few of our friends from... Uh, your part of the country have headed to Israel temporarily and it didn't quite work out. But it was that if you have a drop of Israeli blood in you, you can go to Israel, no questions asked, and settle. So, and the people that began to move in were lawyers, architects, all kinds of people, pretty well qualified. And that was why it was easy for them to buy the kind of properties that they bought. But at that point, there were quite a lot of friendships. Unfortunately, as I said, you know, with the extremists and then subsequent development, then the war that followed in 1948, uh, which then allowed the Israelis, because the Israelis have never lost a war, and every time they won a war, they extend their territory, mm. which is how they've ended up with the Gaza Strip and all that, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But I'm saying that, look, human history suggests and tells us very clearly that because of human resilience, there's no problem that cannot be solved. We've seen the First World War. We saw the Second World War. First yeah. World War, League of Nations. Second World War, Human yeah, but, but, but I mean, the, so, the, the wars were fought before <laughs> peace was well, achieved. Well, in, in a way, that's, in, a way, in this problem. case, don't forget, in this case, mm. I'm not putting Netanyahu on the table yet. I'm thinking about people who can just, whose presence, whose presence, you know, I mean, if you have a problem and some respectable uncle shows up, or if you have a problem, there's nothing like feeling abandoned. And the Palestinians have felt abandoned mm. and uh, frankly, not only abandoned, but actually betrayed. Because people like myself, I was hopeful that with the end of apartheid, when Mandela walked out of prison on the 11th of February, 1990, I'm like, bang, the next thing is now let's head for the Palestinian question. But somehow things changed, the mm. world went to sleep, and the people, you know, the, the Palestinians were abandoned, even by their own Arab brothers and so on. So, that the Palestinian question was taken off the table. But when somebody like Clinton comes in 19, you know, much later, in 1993, history has a way of occasionally bringing two people together. Yishar Rabin and President Clinton and Yasser Arafat. Mm. They are it, it, was a, it was a very a strategic at the, at the alignment. Very, at the, yes. yeah. And if you go back, all the conversations that took place in Oslo, the Oslo Accords, Oslo 1 and Oslo 2, articulated very clearly that look okay we're not going to solve this problem but let's agree I, if if you read the letters mm. that uh, yasser arafat wrote to to rabin to say because hitherto they, i mean they, the key thing the is to accept yes, the right of israel exactly, to exist, to exist. And, yeah. and yes arafat and that's what said, hamas have to yes, do now but no but, to the, end no, but the problem was that when when arafat said we accept israel's right to exist the extremists took the ball and ran with it. Mm. And that was what led to the formation of Hamas and so on. And then, of course, uh, Yishak, Arab, uh, I mean, Yishak Rabin gets killed. And then the problem, I mean, you know, this whole thing is torn. Right. Well, let, let me just come in there because the, 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 the I mean, you've, you've, you've done a very good analysis of the situation there and very logical as well. The problem is that Israel is a dominant force and Israel is exceedingly angry at the moment and Israel wants revenge. I mean, the Israeli government and most of the people in Israel, there have just been surveys done, they want the complete destruction of Hamas, even if it means reducing the whole of Gaza to rubble. And there's also another problem. Um, some of the people you mentioned, 
Barack Obama, for example. Barack Obama had very, very strained relations with Netanyahu. I mean, in fact, Netanyahu used to came into America and just ignored him. Most people would would and and, and Barack went, Obama has strained relations with almost and, and went to to address Parliament. I mean the Congress and so on and so forth. So in that those circumstances, and then they see Gordon Brown as quite a left wing person. I mean Gordon Brown throughout his career was a left wing activist who was always in support of the Palestinians and the Labour Party that he was part of in England always supported the Palestinians. So immediately, the, the, the Israelis are going to get their back up and say, look, I you mean, know, Charles, look, these people I mean, aren't going Charles, to, look, they're not our people, I mean, so are, they're, they're not going I, to support who us. Am I? I'm not exaggerating. I'm not over-dramatizing. Mm. I mean, for me, this is just an expression of my feelings. I don't, I'm not sure that I expect anybody to. I'm happy you're giving me the opportunity. But look, here is what where we are. Mm. You can label anybody. After all, wasn't uh, up to, I was a student in England in 1980, right up to 1989, when Margaret Thatcher was there. Were, everybody was calling uh, Nelson Mandela a terrorist. Mm. Three months later, Mandela was out of prison. He's no longer a terrorist. So those things, items have shifted. Things have changed. Mm. And I think that uh, for me, Netanyahu, what, it, God bless him, let me put it that way. But he's probably, things are going to shift. Yeah. I don't think that Netanyahu will probably still continue to govern. Well, Israel a lot of people of would agree with you. They now, don't think he so, will politically survive Yes, this. I don't, I don't yeah. think so. But most importantly, a victory in this sense doesn't necessarily mean the number of bodies you have, you can count on the ground. Mm. Uh, and I'm also saying that where we are now, the real issue is, if you see what is happening in the Middle East, which is really what drove... Hamas to do what they did. China has already reconciled Saudi Arabia and Iran. <laughs> right? Um, China, I mean, the, the Saudi Arabia mm. was on the verge of having a relationship with, uh, uh, with Saudi Arabia. The story in Egypt is everywhere, literally. So I think that Hamas realized that they were now being isolated. You mean completely. Israel was on the verge of having a, a, a relationship, relationship with, right. with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with Saudi uh, Arabia. With Saudi Arabia. Yeah, yeah. And MBS's revolution, so to say, in Saudi Arabia, despite the restraints and so on, he's unstoppable. There is absolutely no chance that anybody can stop what that gentleman is doing. Mm. And you're also dealing with a generation of young people whose noise is loud. They want a different world. They want a different life. So it's the, the, and what that says to hegemonies around the world, that any identity you construct based, based on a false, whether a superiority of race, it will one day end. Whether it is in South Africa, whether you, if you use religion, like in America, it will end. Mm. In the same way, and that message for us here in Nigeria is to appreciate the fact that you know, there has to be a lot of air in the room. So I think that a lot of these, these conversations, for me, there are no finishing posts. It's mm. just that this is something that... Well, this is the, the start yeah, of the so conversation. For me, the short term yeah. thing is, you can throw away all those names, but I'm mm. just saying this is necessary. No, no, no. I, I think that everybody would agree with you. And I think it's important that when the world is now a global village, when there's a crisis like this, there is absolutely no reason. I mean, people are coming from Europe and all kinds of places. And there are a lot of Africans who are Jews. I mean, there are a lot of Falasha Jews from Ethiopia who are in, in, in the, I mean, I have a cousin who is a Jew and who is, I mean, goes to Israel all the time and has actually been recognized in Israel as a Jew. So the, the point is that there is absolutely no reason why someone like yourself cannot reach out across, you know, in, in any place where, where there's, there's, you know, this kind of horrendous conflict taking place. But I wonder whether there are any lessons that Nigeria can learn from the quagmire in Gaza and Israel. Because Nigeria is, of course, a country, you mentioned this yourself, that's divided along religious lines. And some people are already seeing this latest conflict in Gaza through the prism of religion in Nigeria. Do you think that Middle East crisis could further polarize Nigeria? You know, 
a lot of the even the the false structures that were constructed in Nigeria mm. have fallen. So people say we are Northerners, we are Muslims, we are Christians, uh, we are Southerners, we are Igbos. Truth be told, all of those identities are absolutely rubbish. In part because there's nothing like a Northerner. It may be a Northerner by geography. Uh, there's nothing like, if you say we are all Muslim, what do you mean we are all Muslim? Yeah, but the point if is you that you, you have to Christians. create another no, identity well, no, for no, them to no, leave no, that no, one. But no, but I'm and getting, Nigeria no, doesn't no, have no, no, that no, sense of... Well, that's fine. That's talk yeah. for another day. Yeah. But I'm saying that the instrumentalization of, 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 of identity mm. is a dangerous weapon. So people who say, oh, we Muslims, or oh, we Christians, yeah, that's a good there's point. absolutely nothing like yeah. that. Because in reality, those who have instrumentalized this identity then hang it as a scaffolding. Mm. So somebody says, for example, why should we, ke, an infidel and a Christian, become a minister in the FCT? The, the, the FCT belongs to us. Well, guess what? Unless you are so illiterate that you don't know even the spirit behind the, the, the decision to set up a federal capital territory, something is wrong. But those are people for whom the feeding bottle for survival has been the, the, That's an important the point. instrumentalization of religion. Mm. That is why... It is important that the, federal, the government of the Federal Republic of Nigeria comes to terms with the fact that there are processes. We are not the only diverse country in the world. And people must now be punished for crimes they commit. There, I say to people, there is no, there's no law against killing a bishop. <laughs> there's no law against killing an emir. There's no law against killing a journalist. But there is a law against killing a human being. He may be accidentally a journalist, a sultan, a, a, a bishop, or whatever, but that's not the issue. So when you tell me that somebody has killed a human being, and he tells you that he has done it in the name of religion, that is absolute nonsense, even if we are living in a theocratic state. So the weakness of the Nigerian state is largely responsible for the rising role and place of non-state institutions. Very important Which in a point. democracy, because mm. the business of democracy is to, level, is to level the playing field, so to say. So, and this is why we will remain here. If I, I'm sitting here, somebody thinks I should be anxious because the president of Nigeria is a Muslim, is a Christian. The pre, my, pre, my, my, my minister is this and is that. How, whether he's performing is not the issue. Symbolically, I can understand an illiterate person more or less appreciates the fact that symbolically you can enjoy or maybe as long as we just know we have somebody there. Whether he's doing what needs to be done, and I think I come from northern Nigeria, but you cannot tell me that for all the time we've had power, we're still posting the most negative indices of human survival across this country. We should be ashamed of ourselves. So for me, the world has changed and it is moving. The challenge now for us is, whether young people across this country who are now better informed and have better ideas, we're not talking about handing the country to any group of people, but we must chart a pathway by which I have no reason to feel incompetent or inadequate because of my color, because of my height, because of my... I'm not... If you want me to change a, 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 a bulb, that may be fine, <laughs> you know, but why should my complexion or the language mm. I speak be you know, an issue? Right now it is. And we have no pro we don't have a process for redress. So this is why all these things about religion continue to come back. Because in reality, so ignorant Muslims are saying, oh, Muslim Palestinians, are, who told you that the people who are in Palestine, are they may be accidentally Muslim, they're looking for a homeland. If you love them so much, if you love them so much, on your way to the, you know, all your, all your trips to the Middle East, how many of you have gone to Palestine to see what is happening? But when it is convenient, you know, people begin to appropriate these labels yes. for, for, you know, for their own political end. But we must keep our eyes on the ball, which is how do we stop this carnage? How, what, is there any way we can do? And, I, and like one of the things I said is the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, I think Nigeria has the, 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 the resources, despite our difficulties, we must respond in very practical terms because we have relationships with you know, the state of Israel. Very wise words, uh, Bishop Kuka. I want to thank you very much indeed. It's always a great pleasure to have you and to listen to the words of wisdom that uh, issue from you. Bishop Matthew Kuka is the Catholic Bishop of Sokoto Diocese. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you,